Welcome to Shared Practices Season 2, Episode 1. In Season 2, originally we were just going to do systemization. Now we're doing acquisitions as well. So this episode is systemization. Next week we'll start on the acquisition path. And if you're in that process right now or you're going to be within the next two years, please email me. We're compiling uh, questions and also... I would like to build a document of recommended people to work with. So whether that's CPAs, lawyers, brokers, people that have been super helpful, very useful, um, and vetted by people who've actually worked with them in the past. So email me, richard at sharedpractices.com, if that's you, and I'd love to help you out. And then today's episode is with Dr. Scott Luna of Breakaway Practice. He is pretty amazing, amazing business mind, is building a pretty big group of of dental practices from all the experience he has but he also teaches a series of seminars on business fundamentals systemization even enterprise level if you want to go and and own multiple practices he has a different course for that so we were fortunate enough to be able to pick his brain on some of these topics today and hopefully you guys will enjoy it here he is but you know we get out of dental school and no one really sat down and said hey based on testing all these patients, we know that if you present treatment in this order or in this way, or say these types of things, that your case acceptance will go up. No one got that lecture in dental school. Right. No one got a split testing marketing management lecture or or how do you truly, um, you know, how do you fill your schedule with overdue hygiene patients? What is the script you use on the phone? No one got that lecture. So we're all feeling like we're in the dark. And when we're in the dark, we just look for just some glimpse of light. And that's a job working for someone. I want to dive into this because you're mentioning some specific things that we could call systems, uh, quote unquote. So I got introduced to this idea of business systems via the books E-Myth Revisited and Cashflow Quadrant and this idea of having a job versus a business being a a technician like a dentist who's actually doing the work versus being a manager or an entrepreneur. And for some people, this is a new concept. So what? how would you explain this to a dentist, this idea of what an actual business system is? Well, if you, you know, the way I look at a dental practice is I look at a practice as a machine that has processes occurring meaning a process like we answer the phone and then we have to say things and we have to schedule the patient and putting them in the schedule is a process. How are we going to put them in a schedule and how are we going to deal with their insurance and what do we say when they're in front of us and what x-rays are we going to take? What images are we going to take? You know, it's a, it's a whole long list of processes, a hundred processes going on in this machine. And if we get a predictable result on that process, that means that we're doing the same thing, right? And that same thing, the way we're doing it, ends up being what I would call a system. Okay. And this machine has a hundred different knobs on it that we can turn the right way or the wrong way. And if we use a weak system, we might turn it the wrong way. So if we if we have a weak system of what we say on the phone we might lower our new patient flow. We might turn that knob the wrong way. But if we have a good system that's proven, that's effective, that's repeatable, and we say it a certain way every time, we might turn that new patient flow knob the correct way. And, and when, you know, it's, it's hard to envision running a business as complicated as a dental practice where a hundred things happen at once, unless you look at the hundred things as individual items, bite-sized little pieces. And when you look at it that way, then the next step is learning how you turn the knob, right? And there comes a point though, where we as entrepreneurs or as business owners, we don't have a hundred hands. We can't turn a hundred knobs ourselves. So we have to have a way of turning the knob, a system that other people will be able to do predictably. And so we're not turning 100 knobs. We're turning the five knobs that are controlling the other people who have their hands on 100. Okay. And the bigger you get, the more layers you have to add to that. You know, you you have to become, you have to turn less knobs that result 
and more people turning theirs. And that becomes a powerful system. Um, the old way of doing things was we do everything by hand. We make phone calls, we send out letters in the mail. And the new way of doing things became more using technology. And then the latest way of doing things is making the technology happen all by itself, right? Automation. That's an example of, of going from an old inefficient way to a systemized way to then an automated system. Right. And, and that's how we run businesses. We use that same thought process. How do I take all this work, make it predictable and efficient, and and delegated and ultimately in some ways automated. Okay. So that that was a perfect summary of kind of what this looks like and and why it's important. Um could you provide an example of what does this look like in relation to a specific system? Like I've heard of dentists who talk about systems, talk about a checklist that they want done before they enter the operatory or I've heard of a system that another dentist talked about that was the way they spoke with patients. And so it was a shared language um, versus someone else. It was an operations manual. What does this look like for you? Is it checklists? Is it software? Is it an, a manual? Is it a book? What? How, how are these systems documented and referenced and, and built um, and then implemented, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean... Most of these things that happen in a dental office are being done by a person. Okay. So if it's done by a person, then we need to know what they should do. And once we learn what they should actually do, we have to give them the tools so that they don't forget to do it that way and in that order. So a, a very simplistic example is what do you do when you see the patient in the operatory? Right? Well, we got to take x-rays. we got to get a me medical history. Uh, you know, we might... We, we might do a lot of simple things like that, and we can't forget to do it, though, right? We can't forget to take the x-rays. We can't forget to get the medical history. Right. So all the things we have to do might end up on a simple checklist. But that checklist starts becoming very powerful when we move beyond just the foundational things that have to be done, when we move beyond x-rays. Because what also has to be done is case acceptance, and how do we get case acceptance? It could be things we say, and it could be things we do. For example, we can take an intraoral image of our chief complaint for the patient. Okay. And put that up on the screen, right? Or we could take a smile photo, a close-up smile photo, put that on a flat screen TV right in front of the patient, and compare that smile to a perfect smile. And that might lead to further conversation, it might lead ultimately to case acceptance. We might have the hygienist bring up, before a dentist even walks in, have a hygienist take a photo of a cracked tooth and, and make a statement like, I'm not a dentist, but I'm really worried that you might have a cracked tooth here. Mm. I want Dr. Luna to come take a look at this as soon as possible. Right? That statement would then lead the dentist to go in and verify, yes, there's a cracked tooth. That's a process. We could have a whole choreographed process of what do we show and what do we say to a patient that will ultimately lead to case acceptance. And that process is put on a checklist so we all remember what to do in what order. A word from our sponsor, Q Optics. One of the things that surprised me since Q Optics has sponsored our podcast is how many other people I've found that are already using Q-Optics loops. Ironically, at my workplace, after a couple episodes, I looked around and I realized that three or four of the different doctors I already knew already had their loops. And I asked them about it and they all loved them. They've all had similar stories of, oh, you know, I was forced to use this company in dental school, switched to these, I've loved them ever since. Uh, it's been a consistent pattern. So my challenge to you is if you're in a group setting, if you're in an area where you're working with other doctors and you see there's other loops lying around, take a peek. See if anyone's already using Q-Optics. That way you can try them on, you can ask them their opinion, you can see if they think it's worth it. I think you'll be surprised by how many people are already using Q-Optics that you know. 
If you can't decide if you'd rather have the 3.5X or the 45 schedule a no-pressure look at their product line by emailing sales at qoptics.com. Use the promo code SP16 for $100 off a pair of loops or $300 off a pair of loops and light combo. Q Optics, let's have a better look. Where do you experience the most pushback? I'm sure that you give dentists these systems all the time, and then they go back to their practice, and it, it doesn't necessarily get implemented in the way that might be the most optimal. So is it the dentist who hasn't bought in all the way and, and really believes that we need to systemize this? Or is it the, the team pushing back and saying, oh, well, we've done it this way, or they're just kind of in their old habits? Where where does this break down? And and do you experience or see pushback? Yeah, mo- most practices are running without proper systems merely due to a lack of knowledge. Um, so the, the leader of the practice that might be the dentist, it might be an office manager, just don't know that if you send a specific text two days before you call a patient, you'll actually have more patients say yes to coming back in for an overdue cleaning. Okay. Just didn't know that, right? Because no one tested it and told them and showed them. So there's one breakdown is purely not knowing how to do something, not knowing what financial options give you the highest case acceptance. Right. Right. Then you got the second breakdown where after you know, oh, my God, we got to offer these three payment options. After you learn that, well, then you have a problem with with actually implementing it. And the problem with implementation is I ultimately put that on the shoulders of the leader, okay, so practice owner, because as a leader, we have to influence our, our team to do what's best for the practice and what's best for the patient. And, you know, we all might have a team today doing the wrong things and we might want to change it to the right things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have the right people <laughs> to do the right things. Right. You see, the people we have today are the right people for the practice of today. And the practice of tomorrow might need different people. And our job as a leader is to influence our people of today to become the people we need them to be for the practice of tomorrow. Hmm. And if we're unable to do that, then we ultimately need to let them go. Um, now, what I see is dentists who are weak leaders, who have weak influence, they give up. They're too scared to let anyone go, and they're not strong enough, and they're not um, experienced enough. They don't have the right leadership skills to positively influence their team to do it, so they, they give up. Right. Or, um, you know, or, or they may have the right leadership skills, and they influence most of their team, but they're still left with a bad apple who won't do it. And they still give up. They don't. They don't get rid of that bad apple, right? So, so there's a breakdown in the leader's ability to influence the team. And I don't. I wouldn't put the finger on the team, saying it's their fault. They they really are going to do what the leadership influences them to do. I, I don't blame them. I blame the leader, the dentist. But then there's one last breakdown. Let's say the whole team does it. Let's say so. So the dentist finds the, the, the better information out, the better system, then they implement it and they get everyone to do it. There's a whole nother breakdown with follow through. And because any, any system, any change that's implemented, anything that's worth anything in the practice <laughs> needs to be audited on a regular basis. Okay. And auditing is simply looking to see if it, it's getting done and if it's healthy. It's like a regular set of x-rays we take on patients to audit to make sure they don't have any decay. We have to do the same thing to our practice. We have to audit our practice to make sure we don't have decay. And that auditing, I rarely see occur. And without that auditing, we don't get any system to stick. We don't get to see decay when it's little. We only react when things are really bad. And we just find ourselves putting out fires all day long. Right. So to have the system, first, you have to understand it. Then you have to have the leadership to implement it. And then you have to come back and audit it and make sure that it's actually happening. 
how often are these things being audited? Is this something, you know, what is what does an audit of a system look like? So say that we've decided that we want to answer the phones a certain way. And so we introduce, you know, whether it's, you know, scripting or, or some guidelines that we want our, our front desk to be saying every single time they answer the phones and we convince them through you know our leadership and influence that this is this is going to be a better way to do this and even though it's going to require some change it'll it'll be worth it for our practice so we've convinced them we've given them the tools and the knowledge what kind of follow up of of auto, auditing do we need is this this something that at first you need more and later you need less or is it an ongoing process how what would that look like yeah auditing never stops so it's ongoing and some so some things we can audit through software and that's ideal and some things we have to audit by hand okay okay so when we look at software there's things like metrics tracking uh software that data mines your own practice management software so for example it'll data mine open dental or dentrix or eagle soft and it will, um, it will start diagnosing things inside of the practice and putting them in a dashboard for you to see if they're being done properly. An example of this would be, you know, are your claims healthy? Are, is your claims process healthy? It'll go calculate how long it takes for you to collect any dollar on average that's owed to you by an insurance company. It'll calculate that amount, which is called the days of sales outstanding. Okay. And it'll give you that number in real time. And if that number starts going downhill, meaning something's broken somewhere in the claims department, it'll highlight that in red. It'll sound the alarm. So, so that's automated auditing, right? It is looking at the numbers and letting you know only when, you know, when something's getting bad, you, you then dive in. How often is that? possible like is it only if you've got the right dental software and it's already built to to measure that specific thing it seems like that would be great if it could be done but it seems like there would be a lot of limitations on on how often you could set up an automated system like that well and like i said there's some things that are automated and there's some things that are not on the automated side uh there's software out there that uh, such as the one we use that we love is called dental intel okay at breakaway practice that's that's what we use. Um, and, and it will in real time daily pull all this information. And so, you know, we're, we would be looking at that daily, weekly, and monthly, uh, depending on what we're measuring. And, and the great thing about the automated software, of course, is it doesn't take you needing to know how to do it or have the time to, to calculate all of it. But more importantly, though, it gives your team a scoreboard. Mm. So that they know if they're doing well, they know if they're winning because they, they want to do well, they want to win. So now they can see a scoreboard and know, hey, our claims days of sales outstanding is getting really good this month or our collection um, percentage is getting really good or our reappointment rate for hygiene is, is getting better. So they have a score, a scoreboard. So, so that's, you know, that's half kind of the audits through is, is through technology. OK. The other half has to be done by hand. And. These would be examples of this would be a chart audit where you open up two patient charts a day and you go look for 20 things. Did we did we collect the right amount of money? Did we scan the consent form? You know, did we reappoint them? Did, did we do full mouth probing? Did we get a HIPAA release? You know, those items are vital that we do and vital that we get. But without looking at charts every day to ensure we got it, we're really not going to be holding our team accountable to it. We're not going to see um, that people are just walking out without paying or they're walking out without signing their, their consent forms. We're not going to notice that if we don't look. Another example of that would be um, listening to the phone calls. So once a week, just listening to a few of the phone calls to ensure that they're following the script properly. Okay. Or uh, another example is once a day, we walk through the practice and we've got a simple checklist of things we're auditing. You know, is the coffee bar restocked? Are the restrooms clean and organized? Is the music on? Are the light bulbs working? Are we using the Diagnodent? Are we using our financial options form? 
that's a five minute walkthrough of the office once a day, but gosh, does it become valuable um, because it makes sure that everyone in the office is really doing all the things we know have to be done. And as an owner, I get to go home at night and fall asleep and not worry about it because I'm looking at it every day. Like I could tell you today, the percentage of scheduling mistakes my army of schedulers make. I know that today we had 7% of the appointments we scheduled today had some slight mistake in it. And all of those mistakes were corrected within an hour after the, the appointment was scheduled. Wow. So that the clients that we're scheduling for never saw the mistake. I also know that today, today we had a 7% missed call rate here. Our clients had in the 30s, so their overall missed call rate was 2%. Huh. Yet the national average missed call rate is 38%. And I know that number today. Today. And when I know that we had that kind of a great number today, I go home and sleep great. That's awesome. And, and we do really well. But see, if I'm not auditing it, that number will keep getting worse and worse and worse. And the way we do things will get less efficient. We'll just do whatever someone thinks might be the best or even worse, thinks might just be the easiest. Well, and it seems like what you were saying earlier about walking around the office and you knowing your numbers for today, it's almost just like you were saying earlier, it's almost just as important that the, that your team sees you doing that audit as it is to do the audit itself. And so the fact that they know that you're going to run that report every single day and look at our missed call rate, the the practices we service, their missed call rate, they know you're looking at that. And that is something that they will hear about if it's not where it's supposed to be. That's right. When we see immediately when something's wrong, no matter how big or small that something is, when we can see it immediately and act immediately, then our team and our ourselves are being held accountable to not letting things get out of hand. And, you know, I, I use a funny example of the, the coffee bar being restocked. If I walk around and every day I see that coffee bar isn't restocked and I approach my scheduler to say, why is the coffee bar not restocked? It needs to be stocked every day. Within a couple of days, that scheduler just seeing me walk through the hallway, she'll jump out of her chair and make sure that coffee bar is restocked. Right. And she wants it restocked. She's just busy and she might forget. She has a checklist, but she may, she's human. She may not use it every day like she should. She might have a day where she gets busy and she's, she ignores things. But the fact that I'm walking around checking it makes her then have the drive to do the right thing and get it done. Similarly to I can't work out really well on my own, but when a personal trainer is telling me to do those lunges, I end up doing the lunges. Right, right. right. So that's that's what it's like. Well, and um, I think the work of of being a leader and implementing these systems, it sounds like that actual the work, quote unquote, is the auditing. And so you can teach them, you can say, here's your checklist. But unless you're doing the rounds and checking and following up and asking in a positive, you know, reinforcing sort of way, you know, I've noticed this isn't happening. What's keeping you from from being able to do this? That 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 is how these systems become part of the practice and part of the culture and part of what you do, um, and and that's the hard work that that most people aren't willing to do. Yeah, that's that's exactly correct. And but you know, as a new dentist or a dental student or someone's working in a, in an office as an associate, um, you don't really even have the opportunity uh, many times to to be influential to teach anyone anything, to have, to have the say on how a phone is answered or what the collection process is. You're typically in an environment that does not have metrics tracking and no one's auditing anything. And, and see, the more you learn, the more information you get, the more drive you ultimately have to go own your own practice. Because you realize, holy cow, this place is not running in an ideal way. And I myself could be doing so much better financially and be so much happier with my day and be proud of the practice if I was able to have control and implement some of these types of things. 
that's where really knowing gives you the drive to go out and do. And not knowing, you just fall back into the safety net of let me just try to find a job that's good enough. Absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's hopefully, that's obviously what you're doing with everything that Breakaway is. And hopefully we can help people realize that these things exist through the podcast. And then they turn around and say, okay, I'm ready to get a real education. I'm going to go take all the Breakaway courses. Um, the The next question I had was, how do you know what's worth uh, systemizing? And is it possible to spend all your time and energy systemizing the wrong things? Is there too much systemization? And, and what's worth focusing on? And how do you know if that's the case? Well, I mean, there's some things are classified as you better do it or you could lose everything, right? So sure. You better have consent forms, right? You better file insurance claims. Um, you know, you better answer the phone. Uh, you don't even have to answer it properly. You at least need to answer it, right? So there's these vital things that have to be done. And if we're failing in any of those vital things, then any audit that we do, any decent audit would show it immediately. Okay. So those are the things we'd want to systemize, you know, first. first. Uh, then you go to the next layer that says... Um, you know, here are the things that would really bring value. Um, they're, they're, they're not necessarily mandatory. We're not going to go bankrupt if we don't do them. But man, if we do them, we might really do well. Um, and those would be the next things you systemize. Um, however, I have to caution, though. When I talk about systemizing, I'm talking about taking the majority of the processes and and doing them in a predictable way. But there's always a crazy patient, a crazy situation, a crazy day that is going to break some system. Right. So not every, you know, we can't, we don't have, we're not a robot, right? And our patients aren't robots. So, so we might have a way of systemizing a phone call, but the minute a crazy person calls us, that goes out the window. Right. So it's important that we don't try to build the systems to cover the crazy people. Um, we always have to handle those one-on-one. -on -one. And, and that might sound like common sense, but a great example is that most dental practices feel like it's mandatory to do a full insurance verification breakdown uh, before a patient ever shows up at the practice. And that's an example where they're looking at the situation of someone showing up with an HMO, for example, that they don't take, and saying, we never want to have that happen. And our only solution is to go do all this work ahead of time so that, that that situation will never happen again. And I'm not saying that's bad, but there's smarter ways to handle insurance verification. There's smarter ways to handle an HMO patient that, that aren't as wasteful as verifying insurance ahead of time before they even show up knowing that some of those won't ever show up and we just did all that work for nothing. Right. Well, and that might turn someone off as well if, if you're overly cautious and overly paranoid about the things that could go wrong. I think people get a sense of that when they interact with your, your team and uh, with the dentist. And you have to aim at the 80% and, and not worry about that 10% or that 20% that are, are going to cause problems. Um, one... one of my friends or my classmates mentioned the idea that you have of levers. And he told me to ask you about levers. He said, you know, Scott has this way of talking about systems and different things to tweak and change. And, and so I, I, I don't know too much about it. I know what I know from, from Howard's podcast and interview with you, but um, do you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, I kind of alluded alluded to it a little bit when I talked about, you know, practice is a machine and we can turn these knobs the right way or the wrong way. But I'll, I'll tell you a great example. I could walk you through an example. Okay. Where, you know, we say, you know, we're seeing 30 new patients a month. We, we want more new patients. Okay. Well, there's a lot of things that affect new patient flow. And these can all be viewed as a lever or a knob that we can move the right way or the wrong way. And I'll walk you through them. I'll walk you through some of them. Okay. You know, one is the obvious. Are we answering phones? And a lot of dentists don't realize that about a third of their calls are never answered. 
And the reason why they're not answered is because um, they don't, they're, they're asking for so much information over the phone when they do answer the phone that their phone calls end up being really long. And when you have a long phone call, you can't answer as many. Also, at the peak time of the day between 9 and 1130 uh, in the morning for, an- for phone calls coming in, a lot of offices are tying up their phone lines by confirming appointments and verifying insurance for the next day. Mm. They don't even know the call came in. And most dentists don't utilize outsourcing as a tool, which, which I think most should, where if you do miss a call, you can have that missed call outsourced and have another company answer the phone call, convert the patient into an appointment, schedule it. So there's an example of three levers that we could pull the right way, and then all of a sudden we're going to answer more phone calls. Um, but it doesn't stop there because just because we answer a call doesn't mean we get a new patient. Right. Right. So so uh, a typical conversion nationwide is out of 100 new patients that you talk to, only 42 of them schedule. Huh. And that that, you know, how can we increase that? Like my schedulers schedule around 70 percent. Oh, wow. uh, For the same offices that get 42 by themselves. And why is that? Well, sometimes it has to do with what you say. So if you use a different script, you get to turn that knob a little bit. Right. Uh, Sometimes it has to do with the practice itself. Are you not open in the evening? Are you not open on weekends? Do you not accept MetLife? Do you not see kids? Do you not have affordable entry-level fees? See, all those things affect the patient's conversion if they will schedule or not. Um, so, so those are all things that we can, those are conscious decisions we make about our practice that affect our conversion rate over the phone. And, and so, so, you know, we can answer more calls, we can convert more appointments, but we still didn't get them to show up. So then there's other things that affect our, our no show rates. Okay. Um, we know that if we're booked out beyond 10 days that our no show rates start going up. Okay. Well, how do we get booked out less than 10 days? Well, that has to do with the rules we put forth in our schedule. If we have a schedule that just books people out and on top of each other and next to each other in a haphazard way, like most practices, we end up having a lot of waste in our schedule. If we have a scheduling policy that allows us to just throw a bunch of hygiene appointments all everywhere throughout the day, we may not have enough open time uninterrupted for a bunch of new patients coming in and we might book them out farther. Right. Um, so, so there's, there's things we do that, or, or let's say we're full, we can't help but be booked out three or four weeks. Well, that means we need to change being full. We either need to expand. So we have more capacity mm-hmm. to expand our schedule, expand our hours or our days or our operatories. Or we need to start dropping some of the worst paying insurance plans because we have so much demand that we can afford to drop some plans. We don't want our, our new patients being booked out in no show land. You know, we want them booked out in under a week and a half. That, that's examples where before we even get to see the patient, so many things occurred, things that we have a system on, whether we know it or not. We've made a decision whether it was the wrong one or the right one that's ultimately going to affect, did someone show up? Okay. So it's pretty obvious that every single step along the way, I guess it's not obvious because a lot of people don't think about it this way, but every single step along the way, how you handle that step either increases or decreases the likelihood of them ultimately showing up and accepting treatment and then following through with treatment. So that kind of is a, a, a awesome picture of systemization why it's important, how it is implemented and how it doesn't get implemented, and then some specific examples of that. And I I really appreciate it. That was one of the things I really wanted you to talk about and share, because I think it's just not not a concept covered in dental school, like you said earlier. So that was the second half of our interview with Dr. Luna. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Go to breakawaypracticeseminars.com if you want to learn more about what he can do for you and the courses that he teaches down in San Antonio. Um, other than that, uh, leave us a review on iTunes. If this has been helpful for you at all, reach out to me and we'll be putting out some more content around acquisitions coming soon. Talk to you next time. <laughs>